I'd say the same thing about backwards hats. Backwards hat. Are you on a skateboard? Cool. Yeah. Are you not yeah. on a skateboard? Not very cool. Scotch. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 400. What? <laughs> <laughs> Episode 400 of Coffee with Butterscotch, the game dev comedy podcast of Butterscotch shenanigans. I'm Seth, and I'm the games programmer. I'm Adam, and I'm the webs programmer. I'm Sam, and I'm not a programmer. Ha ha! Uh, Sam is a show? programmer of people's hearts. Oh, yes. Moon That's programmer. Yeah. And eyes. And eyes. Yeah, Which true. is less romantic sounding, but still utilitarian and useful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. And you know what they say, eyes are the windows to... The brain. So you're also a brain programmer. Yep. 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 yep, yep that's yep, right. Yep. People and say that's that. also where your soul is. So you're a soul programmer, really. Yeah, I'm gonna get that. I'm a soul programmer. Give me. That's good. Soul programmer. <laughs> uh, this is a show where we talk about life, business, and working in the games industry. Today is January twenty seventh, twenty jubilee, or twenty twenty three. If you're not sure what year that actually is. Uh, before we get started, we have a warning. There's going to be profanity on this show and also uh, news. So if yeah. you don't like either of those things, then uh, you know you're gonna you're gonna have a real bad time. Okay. Yeah, not like world news though. We're, we're not just just we're not talking yeah, about that stuff. There's just news, news about like just some stuff that's going on. You know. Uh, and also, we'd like to thank our supporters over at MoneyGrab.Bscotch.Net. We got a donation from Narga Trucky Dipatub, who oh. said. <laughs> Uh, which for those who are, who don't know, when you make an account on our site, we give you a randomly generated name, which you can change, you know, but we have a random name generator that Why makes you real. Which you can. Yeah, you can, but should you? You shouldn't <laughs> because it's great. Uh, so Narga Truckee says, uh, y'all are forbidden from spending this cash on coffee. Forbidden. Mm-hmm. It's either some sweet, sweet fennel tea or some. Mother clobbering lemon balm tea. I don't know what that Ooh. means. Did you say fennel uh, tea? I'm more hung up on the mother clobbering aspect of this. Tea. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. <laughs> this is a multi layered onion of a donation. <laughs> well, it's a fennel of a donation, I think. Because a fennel is kind of onion shaped, you know? It's I have like, no idea what fennel me is. Neither. I just know it's like I hipster li- fennel stuff. <laughs> it, it is what hipster. It's a. Uh, it's, it's got like nice. a black licorice kind of a, not like exactly, but it's like in that. Kind okay, of I'm out. Taste yeah, profile, I, you know? Say no more, I'm done. <laughs> it's like a big, it's Bounce. like a big bulbous kind of a, kind of a base. And then like little, little, uh, little frondy, little, little like spidery appendages that come off of it. Wow, hate, this is just sounding more and worse more. and worse. <laughs> That's pretty good stuff. Got, I actually you know, grew some, but I'll warn all your listeners out there. If you plant fennel, that, those little shits just like just get everywhere they just i was finding it just like little baby fennel plants like coming up out of every fucking part of my yard i don't know how well, they got so there's there. just no upside to this to this plant it yeah, smells it's good just, and it does like if you're into the taste because it's a very so i like using the word opinionated for these kinds of things because mm-hmm. it's not saying that it's good or bad but it makes itself known you know it's, it's loud it's loud it's about very its opinionated presence. so if you're putting fennel in something like you know fennel is in there you know there's no <laughs> There's no getting around. It's kind of like sesame oil for anybody who cooks with sesame oil. Ever like mm-hmm. you put a drop of that shit in something, and you're like, "Wow, there's sesame oil in here." You know, like yep. you can't not tell. Um, so if mm-hmm. you don't like it, then yeah, you just kind of have to stay away from it. But it's, it's you know, good you know good sometimes your I, I your tastes change uh, as you get older. Mm-hmm. You know, and every now and then you'll come across something where you're like, "Wow, I didn't used to like this, but I tried it again later in life, mm-hmm. and it's great." Right. Mine well, mostly goes the other way these days, but yeah, it could be. Yeah, but either way, it's that you know something you know you're, you're something that you liked, you don't like, or vice versa. Uh, and I've never liked black licorice, you know. And so I love it was like a, it was like a year and a half ago. I was like, you know, I've always hated this, but I also haven't had it in a really long time because I hate it so much. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Again, like, very opinionated like, taste. Right. Like. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I'm gonna. I'm going to check in on this situation and I, I bought some and I tried it and I still hate it. I still hate it so much. It was Sometimes horrible. Just the, way it is. <laughs> the, funny, the funny thing about those kinds of things is that the, the higher quality of like, of like a black licorice you get, the worse it actually is for people who don't like the black licorice taste. Cause because it's just that. even more. It's just even like better. At doing itself, you know? It's like, like how you need to refrigerate things that don't taste very good. 
so that they taste better. You know what I mean? Yeah, if you have like an like, unchilled, like poor, low quality beer, like a Coors Light, but it's yeah, but it's warm, even remotely. I guess just not even not even very cold. And then you're like, wait a sec. Just taste I, just I remember tastes it like in my horrible in, pee. <laughs> in my marketing classes in college, they were talking about they were talking about the brilliance of the marketing teams behind like Coors and Budweiser and stuff. Because the only thing that they advocate for in their ads is that their product is cold. Yep. yep. Right? They're like ice cold Budweiser. Ooh. Mm-hmm. It's it's Miller time and it's always like in a bucket of ice, right? It's like, drink this cold, please. Yeah, <laughs> which is like quite a flex when you get those. Cause like I'm a I'm a craft beer, you know, person. I like to get all those like indie breweries and to try out different stuff. And it's quite the flex. You like you read the back of some of those and they'll be like, best served at room temperature. You know, if like Whoa. for certain like like dark beers and stuff, you know, like you just like store it at room temp, you just pour it in a glass, you just drink it that way. And I've like a the ones that I've had been stellar every time it's, good. it's just it a hilarious good. flex where it's like it has this it beer is good. so good of and course it still has flavor it's you gotta beer, like so. beer you know so, yeah. <laughs> right, which is a whole a whole discipline you have to get buy into but you gotta acquire that taste yeah all uh, taste you gotta you gotta acquired. rep grind it uh all right well let's get into so so today's episode we got some life news and then we're just gonna go into questions mm-hmm. uh so sam Take it away. Well, what's happening? Yeah, a few things. Number one, uh, my wife and I decided a few years ago that we were going to try making a baby, and baby's the only way should be mm. should be popping out here in a handful of weeks. Basically, any time from here to the next to like it could be basically. five minutes from now. We- it could be. I'm on edge, <laughs> folks, because <laughs> this thing is this thing is it's on the way, and. Couldn't be more excited. It's been quite the quite the trip, which I may talk about at length at some point. Uh, but involves IVF because of all the cancer stuff that we had. That you know, Diana, my wife, managed that with with the grace of a badass soldier of sorts. Just sort of. Uh, mm. and for those who are familiar with the story, it was Sam who had cancer. Yeah. Now, yeah. when was your remission? Like the full the, the full 20, one? Like that's December of twenty fifteen. Yeah, because we're. Beyond the five year mark now by another year, I guess another couple of years yep. even. Yep. I think it's about eight years. Yeah. Still got a few more years before or, I get life insurance, yeah. but uh, you know, it's coming. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yes, yeah, so we, you know, we, we decided we wanted to have a, have a bab and that was part of our, part of our thing with moving out, getting closer to her family on the East coast and all that. And so we've been on that, that journey for, a, oh man, I don't know, a year and a half or so, which is also one of those funny things that I do want to say for anybody who does want to have kids at some point. I think there's a sense because of how careful we're told to be about accidentally having kids for so long. There's a sense that like as soon as you want one, that you could just sort of have it. And that is not accurate in the slightest <laughs> for most people. Yeah, for some uh, people it yeah. is. Like some people like they just look at something funny and then all of a sudden they've got a kid now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but uh, but I think for for most people it's actually the case that it takes a while. It takes at least six months to get pregnant. Um, for most people, the, the norm, the natural way. Uh, let alone if you have to do IVF and all the other stuff, uh, kind of like we had we had to do. So, IVF um, meaning uh, in vitro fertilization. It's uh, it's using the magic of high technology to uh, to make a bab to take all the money out of your bank account. But yeah, also basically, we'll do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So so that's. Been it's been a heck of a journey so far, and now we are approaching this the, the final this final push, if you could, if you will, um, mm-hmm. for this baby to arrive. And I'm very excited, um, could not be more pumped for. It. But that means I will be at some point randomly disappearing from the podcast for one to two weeks ish, uh, depending on you know how zany stuff is, how angry of a baby it turns out to be. Uh, since some of them apparently are pretty easy, some of them come out just sort of screaming, just kind of constantly. For a while, so we'll see which one, what what roll of the dice we get, um, and I'll be back, kind of hanging out after that. But good, good, fair warning. And then in preparation for that, you know, I've always wanted a giant sleeve tattoo. Uh, so secretly, for a few months leading up to uh, Adam and Seth and the rest of the fam visiting for uh, Jenny and Sampy visiting for um, my birthday in December, we all got together. I snuck away from the studio and went and had two very long sessions to get a giant full sleeve tattoo on my left arm. But I've been wearing full coverage clothing on uh, webcam the whole time. And so <laughs> it 
But everybody arrived. Nobody knew. <laughs> Nobody knew. And, uh, and when everybody arrived in uh, December, then I was like, oh, oh, I got something. Let me, let me go grab it real quick. And then I went around the corner and then just pulled my arm out of my sleeve and then came back with, you know, my giant tattoo on display to everyone's screams, which was just so fun. <laughs> it went exactly it is a way. It is a very cool tattoo. <laughs> yeah. What, uh, he's easily one of the cooler ones that I've seen. Yeah. Um, this is done by uh, Caleb Culpitz in uh, Cambridge. He did a great job. And it's two, basically six-ish hour sessions, which is a lot. But I uh, actually took a nap during one of them, which I didn't think was going to happen. I fell asleep while being tattooed. He said it's only I mean, it is boring. It's... It's, it's strange just meditative. Kind, kind of, of sitting there. But yeah, <laughs> I think it's well. Yeah, my experience was until they hit around my elbow and up on my shoulder. It was mm-hmm. just kind of like like it, it, it hurt a little bit, but it like but yeah, I got I just got it wasn't a big deal. And I got and I was just kind of used to it, so I was just reading like my Kindle the just whole time. You know, um, I could see how I could have fallen asleep, except the tattoo parlor itself was just kind of a noisy space um, mm-hmm. when I had it. But but yeah, as soon as they hit the elbow, though, that was. That was Wide awake. It's a tender spot. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah so- and I mean, that was a good move, Sam, because like you can't, you can't like be a dad and not and have a not have a tattoo. tattoo. That was That's crazy. That was literally a thing where it was like, okay, I've been, I've been trying to figure this out for a long time. And I talked to that guy, I think back in April, uh, after we had tried our, our first round of, of IVF stuff, my wife and I, um, and I was like, okay, clearly I like, if this is going to happen, I need to get a move on this stuff. And it took like eight months to get in, you know, it takes, it's a whole, it was a whole trip to get in the, the dang sleeve done. But I was like, I want this, I want this baby to not know me without tats. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want that. This baby needs to know. Yeah. By the time she can focus her eyeballs, she should be looking at this. T- which, yeah. which arm is it? It's your left arm. Left right? arm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is also good. Cause that's, that's presumably your Baby holding arm, so you can use your right arm to do stuff, right? So mm-hmm. I think so. So, yeah. so she'll just be nestled in there with the tattoo yep. the whole time. Yep. Yeah. So the tattoos of a giant uh, uh, phoenix fighting a dragon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is, and it goes dope. all the way from like top, like top above to the shoulder down to the like. It's like, is it past the wrist a little bit? There's a little bit of a tongue poking past the wrist. Yeah. So it is legit, like a full. Full on sleeve. Yeah, I love it. I, I used to have the biggest tattoo, and now Sam is overtaking me. And now my wife is going to get another one. And so then she'll have like, because right now I have, she has like more tattoos, but mine covers more total space, I think, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Square but she's also going for a sleeve, potentially, mm-hmm. or some kind of a big piece anyway. And so pretty quick. This here. is sort of an arms race. It, it is, it is an arms race. Many <laughs> ways. Uh, that's good. Exactly. Uh, that's good. Okay. Well, so so as far as then, like what we're gonna do in the studio with with Sam becoming a dad, all that stuff. Uh, it's an interesting time because um, because Sam is our artist, mm-hmm. right? And so one of the things that we're that we're trying to do is make sure that he has the time that he needs to, or take however much time he wants to take, right? Uh, away from work to experience, you Baby. know, bringing this this person into the world because it's a it's not something that you get to do very often, and it's kind of a big deal, right? Um, and so we so we're we're kind of keeping it like loose. It's not like a oh you know we're gonna like give you X months of leave or whatever. Um, it's more of a, we'll just try to communicate about it and mm-hmm. stay like, and, and keep in touch. And, and, uh, also my understanding is, is that there's, you know, there'll be periods where things are chaotic and periods where things are calm. And it's not necessarily the case that, that, uh, you'll even like want to just not be doing any art for three months or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think my, so. my general take on it, and I've talked about this with my, uh, with my wife and stuff as well which is that we'll, we'll have plenty of family here helping out with grandparents and stuff. They've been kind enough to come hang out with us basically for the first little bit. Um, and then on top of that, you know, the reality is that my position both at the studio and on the team is, is it's both fortunate and unfortunate in the sense that, you know, if you, as small a team as we are, um, being, you know, one of the leads on design stuff plus business stuff plus doing art it's like it's hard it is hard to fully disengage uh i think in a responsible way for a very long time so i i don't think i'll be out for uh in, in like a full-on capacity for 
for a super long time so much as just kind of a migrating back at a part-time capacity, you know, relatively quickly and helping out to push, yeah. keep pushing business and design stuff forward, at least if not, you know, the hours required to just crank out assets and stuff like that. Probably yeah. Be- and this is one of those kind of interesting, complicated topics, especially in, you know, U S labor, right. Uh, mm-hmm. Where there just is no guarantee of any sort. Right. And like for our, for our staff, for the people we employ, we would do a more typical like, oh yeah, like we'll set aside like an amount of time. Yes, we did this before. Like sense. Like we gave money two months, you know, paid it to even stuff. She don't yeah. work for us for two yeah. months. And it, so and it like, and then with some kind of like an easing back thing, or we would sort of negotiate something where it's like, oh, well, if you can just like work a few hours a week to take care of this one like administrative, thing, you know, it, like we'll try to like find a, a way like that that even as a small team can make work. Um, but as somebody who like owns and you know runs the company is like responsible for the primary product and is making the decisions about what that thing is supposed to be, right? Yeah, it's it's trickier. <laughs> it's trickier to step away. But but a lot of what we've been doing over the years to make the company into a place where we've done upfront investments into everything to make everything as like slick and smooth as we can. We've been working on making async work more and more possible. We've been working on uh, how the work is divided and how work ownership works so that people can have a lot of autonomy and and that we're things trying are, to, things trying are to prevent fires yeah. yeah we're trying to prevent things from blocking other things and so the net effect of all of this is that uh anybody in the studio really um no matter how like temporally integral their role is um should be able to take significant mm-hmm. leaves without the whole thing falling apart right as long as we have some advanced warnings yeah, things will fall apart plan for sure. right yeah, um, but I mean, otherwise, we're trying to we try to make the, the studio a place where you want to work anyway, not because you feel like you have to, but because like it's, it's enjoyable. It's enjoyable mm-hmm. stuff to be doing, so that and, and so yeah, so find that balance is both for the people who are like owning a company and trying to make it go, as well as like the employer employee relationship is a tricky one in a context like ours where. There's no laws, so you just gotta try to find do whatever. Yeah. Just Maybe do whatever. There's no, there's no help. You know, from a no, oh, yeah, there's no laws and no help. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it is. It's unfortunate in the sense that at the end of the day, no matter what, uh, we will we bear the we bear the responsibility of someone being gone for X amount of time, right? Because um, it's the United States of America. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah, and honestly, <laughs> it's 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 kind of a tricky topic as well when it comes to not even just like being a, an owner of a company, but just having a small company in general, right? Like, mm-hmm. let's say let's say you run like a like an auto repair shop and it's it's just like you and then like two mechanics and an administrator. Right. And it's like, well, uh, if one of your mechanics suddenly has to be gone for three months, mm-hmm. what, what do you do? <laughs> right. Right. Like, like, like it's, it, yeah. And it's like, it's, uh, I, I definitely support the idea of like companies, like there should, should be laws about things like paid leave and like there should be all these guarantees, but you also have to recognize what happens to small companies in that scenario, which is like, yeah, if they don't have financial, they're slack. just, they're just kind of screwed. Um, it's very hard. And, and it totally makes sense. And like, if you're talking about like, oh, it's like an auto manufacturer that has 10,000 employees. Yeah. If, if one person's gone for three months, there's a, there's a lot of ways to shuffle resources around to compensate for that. But smaller companies, yeah, well, you just uh, assume you know, a small percentage of your workforce is absent in any amount of time, right? So yeah, you, you have a, you have slack in your workforce, basically. But, yeah, but if you have your workforce is four people, one person gone is a, qu- a quarter <laughs> of your workforce is missing. Yeah. For, and that's why yeah, which, that's why it's, you need to be investing early and often into, into the good ability to have slack to absorb. Right? Yeah, yeah. To absorb that stuff. yeah. So yeah, you got to be real careful about it. And yeah, of course, some some business models and some industries you know, can, can handle that slack or develop that slack way, way better than others. I think, you know, we're, we're fortunate in that we have this long term product development cycle Mm -hmm. where we can shuffle priorities around. So one of the things that we'll be doing is, you know, while Sam is, is gone or on like a much reduced uh, Mm -hmm. capacity, then we'll be taking care of lots and lots of these sort of outstanding programming problems in the game. Um, going through some like system updates, optimizations, stuff that doesn't require a uh, big design a and art. Yeah. yeah. But that's like, it's got to happen. Um, maybe even things like updating our localization tech and making sure that's working, you know, because like, again, we don't need sprites for that. We just yeah. need a system of handling text. Right. Um, 
So yeah, there's lots of stuff that, that we can do and we can just kind of shuffle things around. And so, um, yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm super very, pumped. I'm very fortunate to be in the position I'm in, frankly, with all the stuff, especially what if, you know, I think having the support of the studio and, and you guys and um, being able to, you know, just have those honest discussions about what we need to do all this stuff super effectively. Because my wife and I have always talked about with the whole pregnancy and everything else, um, it's going to be hard. There's a lot of hard stuff that we've done already, but uh, I think part of our trick has been asking a slightly different question during all of it, which is always, um, you know, given that this is hard, how can we still have a good time? You know, most of the time, because I'm a strong believer that that is very possible in uh, even in the darkest situations that you can imagine that you can it's actually well, still have a pretty good time most of the time. Um, well, I didn't reframe that as like. It, it's, I think it's difficult to have a good time unless you're doing something that's hard, you know? Like, if all you're doing is easy, boring stuff, then well, it you're just going to be bored, you know? You know if yeah, you yeah, I, yeah, I don't mean it in the choosing of a hard thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. just like, you know, yeah, dealing with dealing with the, the throes of life, you know, the oh, bullshit yeah. that you got to deal with. Yeah, if you're not um, drowning in the difficulty, which unfortunately is, you know, how... That's so true. That's not a, yeah, that's not, that's on the, uh, you know, when we talk about games, we talk about like, there's a, a, a meeting of your skill and yes. your capacity to deal with something. And then the challenge, like the, the scale of the challenge, right? And it's like, there's a, there's a flow state in the middle where things are good, but then there, it's possible for things to go too far and you're frustrated and having a bad time. Mm-hmm. Right where the challenge far exceeds what your capacity is to handle it. On the flip side, uh, it could be boring as hell because nothing is happening <laughs> yeah. and and you have nothing to do. Right, so you want to yeah you want to find that. But uh, yeah. yeah, you got yeah. a good Framing support can system. Help a lot, you know, help you on your balance, right? But it can't uh, can't, it can't solve well. anything. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's just a perspective shift. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we're super pumped. Uh, Adam and I get to be uncles. Yeah. Gonna 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 have a good time with that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I don't, I don't know what my uncling strategy is going to be. I'm, I'm, uh, going to join some, uh, uncle Facebook groups. Uh, <laughs> no, that's that's where you some, fall down into QAnon. So don't read don't, some don't uncling, <laughs> uncling guides. Um, maybe there's like a, is there, there's probably like an uncling YouTube channel I can it's subscribe to. I imagine. <laughs> uncling convention. Mm-hmm. Uncling is a verb, right? Yeah, I think the, so. Yeah. Okay. It sounds yeah, I'm going to I'm going to uncle as as well as I can. Yeah, I think uh, I think the idea is you still have to train up in uh like dad joke uh, architecture, you know, and like get that yep. get that system down really well. But you don't have to train up and do any specking into like discipline um mm-hmm. uh long-term financial planning. You know, that's true. Yeah. You can put the, you can allocate those talent points somewhere else. Yeah. You put them all, yeah. you can basically put them all into like dad jokes and then being, yep. and then seeming like you're cool, you know, yep. being cool jokes and, and gifts, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. That, well, and, and, the, and the gifts, are, <laughs> yeah, the gifts and candy is all still into the being cool territory because it's being cool oh, for, a, for, a, for a child, you know, not being cool, like for other adults. So that's true. That's not, well, I mean, these look very different. I feel like they're very different, (laughs) you know? So like for a kid, like if you're, I mean, there's some intersections, you know, like tattoos, cool for everybody. Definitely. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sunglasses, either douchey or cool, depending on the rest of what's going on, you know? Yeah. Uh, and candy though, cool as fucking shit for like mm-hmm. me also, but also for children, you know, mm-hmm. but not for really. I'd people. say the same thing about backwards hats. Backwards hat. Are you on a skateboard? Cool. Yeah. Are you not yeah. on a skateboard? Not very cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the circumstance where a backwards hat is cool on a skateboard. Uh, all right. Well, do you have any final thoughts on it or do you want to? No, that's it. Uh, it's, it's happening. Up. It's happening. It's 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 coming unpredictably. Buckle. So uh, very excited. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna get on to some questions, um, and it's also likely that that in the coming weeks we're gonna as as things develop with the baby situation, our focus on what we're doing in the studio is gonna shift into a lot more kind of like tech technically oriented stuff that is pretty boring to talk about on the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we want to get probably more questions in uh, so that we can kind of spend more time just answering questions and talking about what it is that our listeners want to hear because, you know, studio news will be kind of light. Um, so definitely go over to podcast.bscotch.net and ask as many questions as you can, upvote questions. We want a good backlog of great mm-hmm. questions uh, in the coming couple of months. Yeah, so. and soon, very soon, that podcast page will be replaced with a new one that – 
Still has the question section like the same as it is, but the top part is getting, being replaced with a player that goes to Transistor FM, which is our new podcast host. So it's a real, actually good podcast wow. player. Wow. Uh, the, the whole thing right now where it's like <laughs> you open it up and you see like the HTML from the the episode description, right? And like a little box with a, with a slider. Yeah, don't worry about that. Yeah, don't that, worry about that. That's also getting fixed. Um, it's fine. So, yeah. So soon that, that page will be a much nicer place to visit to go ask your questions. But it still works now. So go ask your questions anyway. Just ignore yeah. Just ignore uh, what it looks like. You know? Yeah, don't worry about it. Just scroll down. Scroll down. Just scroll down. Questions. Yep. Uh, all right. Highest uploaded question comes from Fraser who says, after the success you saw with level heads at early access, Will you try it again for Crashlands 2? Could it be worthwhile even without a looming external deadline like what happened with Mario Maker 2? Mm. Uh, and does a more story-driven game meaningfully cut down replayability? The Subnautica Gambit. Mm. Uh, I would say to the latter question, yes. Uh, yeah. A lot. A lot. And that's one of those things where I think get to choose. And, you know, in the case of a sequel, uh, the choice has been made for us in many ways, which is the it's Crashlands. If Crashlands didn't have a story, that would be weird because it's also where, you know, it's a humorous game, but it's it's uh, humor is largely delivered through just strange dialogue and stuff. And so yeah. uh, not having that available doesn't feel very Crashlandsy. y um, Yeah. And that's our that's the franchise niche, too. Right. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. That's what I was going to say, which is that I think, you know, we are looking at how to differentiate in a particular genre. In our case, we chose to add to add in the story aspect to uh, something like a survival genre, which naturally does mean that it's a it's got a more particularly authored experience to it. It has humor in it, which these elements don't. Um, but that also means that replayability will be a bit lower in terms of like, yeah, you're not going to necessarily not necessarily fully restart to like choose a different uh, I don't know spec or something like that. But I think where where we get benefits then is basically on the like basically emotional hits of in character you know character bonding and stuff like that things that you don't normally get in a in a survival or kind of a crafting RPG context. Um, I think if you thread that needle well in terms of like how much of the game is you participating in story in the, in the sense of like you're interacting with the characters and going through a sequence of, of, uh, story beats where kind of things are, things are happening, I guess, but, and you're, you're like part of what's happening, but it's kind of like things are happening. You're participating, right. If that Mm -hmm. kind of makes sense. I think that's what we normally think of when we think about story driven is there's kind of a linearity to it. And cause the question asker noted like for subnautica, Right. Mm -hmm. Which I actually don't think of at all as a story driven game. Right. It it is like it's good. There's a, there's a story and there, well, no, I mean, there's a story. There's like, there's, Mm -hmm. there's things that unfold when you hit certain milestones, then like you, a new part of the story unwraps, you get pointed to new locations. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a very light touch kind of thing. Like you need those things to happen to kind of change things in the world. Right. At certain moments. Um, Okay. But, it's really still like the moment to moment and the vast majority of our actual gameplay experience is this open world kind of do whatever you want crafting mm-hmm. experience, right? Um, and original Crashlands was similar, but with some more story in terms in the, again, in, the, in that sense of like a lot of interacting with characters and dialogue and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so for OG Crashlands, I felt like that still from a, like a replayability standpoint still kind of works because you're not spending most of your time like engage with dialogue and stuff right or doing right. a very specific sequence of events you're still getting to choose what you're doing most of the time so that the replayability doesn't go way down and for crashlands 2 we're trying to expand the scope of the kinds of like moment to moment things you can just go do out in the world mm-hmm. so that even though there is a lot of story there'll be more story inter- again in that same sense of characters and dialogue and things that have to happen right um I think you'll still be able to engage with it. Like I've, I've replayed the original Crashlands, like the opening few hours, I don't know, six times on purpose, mm-hmm. you know, um, and the whole game, maybe twice. Right. Because again, there's just enough story that you get to like re-engage with it and it's fun, but you're still mostly doing your own thing. Yeah. I think but for early access, it's, though, I think it's a different, yeah. But I think for early access, that doesn't really, that's a different kind of thing is early access is like frequent delivery of new stuff. Right. And I think that yes. works if there's enough stuff to do that you can still be playing the game, even if you've run out of story or whatever. Right. And if you don't have to restart the experience each time new stuff comes out. So I, you know, I think my current thinking on it, which is changing all the time, 
mm-hmm. is that early access for Crashlands 2 would be a bad experience for most people unless I, we I did think it'd it. be hard for us to make a good experience. I think that's true. Yeah. Well, I, I think it'd be a bad experience for a lot of our players and for us. Because yeah. one of the th- one of the things that you know we've been doing a lot of as we've been developing the game is reworking stories, right? Because as game systems unfold, as we add new things in, we want to integrate them uh, into the world, and that that includes, in some cases, completely removing storylines that that we re- later realize existed as a workaround for the fact that this game system didn't exist, right? Um, and we, we still have the same like concept in place, maybe for like our, like, for example, our opening sequence of what happens when the, when the player first starts playing. Um, but the things that are said, the things that the player has to do, where the player has to go, those things have all actually completely changed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the quests that the player is doing in some cases are totally new quests that didn't exist in that original story. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's, so, that's what I meant by like, if you have to replay the thing over and over again, which is what you'd have to do and the game's current state if we did early access with the yeah, game you, like you'd have now, to is you'd have to because we would be changing stuff yeah, and would change we wouldn't, much. yeah, we wouldn't know what you have missed. Right. Um, and a lot of times the quests will uh, direct you to places or or we will update a quest to have some a dialogue tweak and like a marker or something that will like point you somewhere, right? Or a quest uh, may be like off to the side somewhere and that gives you an item that's like super useful, um, but you may have already moved on to a new area of the game and you don't have that thing anymore, right? And so it, I think it becomes super difficult when given that a story is – sequential and actually um in the case of of crashlands i would actually disagree that it like in crashlands the story um feels light but mechanically it's not because it's it gates everything like yeah. you yeah, gotta yeah. Move, yeah, i'm not i'm not, yeah, I'm not saying quests, you can right? deal with uh because there's two sort of two questions here right one is replayability which is a related but separate problem from live development right uh, yeah, because in early access specifically, because in early access, the idea is the game isn't done yet. That's why you're doing early access. Right. And yeah. Seth, as you're saying, if you have a linear sequence of things, no matter how it shakes out, no matter what the player experience is creating that linear experience, if that thing changes a lot over early access time, then man- doing version control, or doing version management of player data and game state and all this kind of stuff is that I was art like with with level head where people are just making levels their own fucking levels you know <laughs> right mm-hmm. yeah with level head that was already really hard Keep and it's like, a fully modular game where like we could add new items and it's just like yeah the old levels don't have them yeah just not in there now that's that's fine right and we could also if um, we change the behavior of items which we did here and there like tweaked them a little bit right we could still d- version that because we knew what version we can record the version of the game that you played your save on, right? So Seth could just have logic that says, oh, if like the save is above this version, then then this item does this. Do this and stuff, otherwise, right? it does the old behavior. Because, so we'd actually, we'd actually yeah. in some cases, preserve bugs. Yeah. But yeah. The, and the, so the other kind of weird thing about this idea of like early access is the, it's not even just the problem of replayability, but it's also of partial playability. So in a yeah. game like Levelhead, if we only have 50 of the items in the game, but we're intending to have 150 – you can still make all kinds of crazy levels with 50 items. Yeah. And and you can have you can have what I would consider like a full experience of the game and we can just keep making it better. And us adding of, new items doesn't make you need to go change your old levels. Right. It just makes you even more pumped about just make mixing those items. Yep. Well, with a story, you know, it's it kind of like if you if you start getting into like a new series, you know, uh uh on Netflix or something. And then like two thirds of the way through one of the episodes, it just stops, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh yeah, well this this show is in early access and we haven't written the last part of this episode yet. Well, that's what would happen with quests, Two weeks later, right? they re-release like, it and you can well, start think, from well, where I you guess, left off, but also I, they've changed a whole bunch of stuff in the beginning that might be worth you know, rewatching. Yeah, I think I, th- I think about it a little bit differently from the way you guys are talking about, which is that I think there there is a way to do it, but it requires, it requires a certain level of, uh, I would say like assuredness about what you've already done in terms of locking things in place because the reality is like if you when you watch a show right or seasons of a show there is an end point where there's oftentimes threads that are left open and that's sometimes very very fun very exciting right you got your uh, cliffhangers and stuff right so there's a particular way to do this that we where we 
the way we could execute on it would be something like we've already finished the whole first zone and we have all the systems in place. It's basically like you have to hit a certain level of the game being done from a system standpoint, right? And then you basically say, we're not going to add more systems, probably, and they're not going to be ones that like would back Echo into the sort of uh, story stuff happening. The first yeah, one- You're basically talking about episodic content. It's just, yeah, I th- and I think that's that's the way we would have to think about it. Um, and that's what you'd have to execute on it versus like level head where you could, you could really have like hot builds coming out just like moment yeah. by moment. But, that, but that does like, change like the, the, what it means. Cause I, I think really this question comes down to like, like we often think of it as like, as, Oh, well story content doesn't do well in early access because of this idea that like, if you play it once it's done. Right. But I think as we're kind of getting out here, the real problems have to do with like that. That's a, that's an issue that if you're lucky is the issue. Right. But in reality, the actual issue is that there's all these technical questions of what does it mean to deliver a incomplete game product to people that you plan to add more content to. Right. And and how can you actually do that in a way that will allow you to have a successful early access campaign? Right. Because like for for early access to be successful, you basically need to bring in players who bring in other players so that people are excited about it and they want more content and they keep coming back and re-engaging with what you're doing. Um, and no matter what kind of game you have, that is an incredibly difficult thing to mm-hmm. pull off. Um, and for mostly for all these like really technical combined with design problems of dealing with the idea of just what does it mean to make something worth coming back to and how do you enable people to come back to it and have a good time every time right and depending on the kind of game you have what that means is going to be different but i think sam as you're saying like for something like crashlands what that really means in effect is that we have to already be done with the game yeah right like and then you're done and basically you're in like a in like a content pushing thing but as we've experienced as we know as you build more content typically you need yeah you want to be able to change the game want additional systems and so i think the way i would think about it is, is questions to be less a candidate for early access unless it was uh more along the lines of that kind of episodic style which could be fun maybe be interesting um but again would require a different kind of approach for us mentally about how we're building uh once we finish that first chunk uh, yeah. I think it'd be a better candidate for just doing a few of these kind of uh, closed alphas, closed betas, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, on and I think that's the way I prefer it. Yeah, because right, that way you can just throw away user data and start fresh, basically. Right? Yeah. yeah, you don't um, worry about it too much. You get the, with, you with get a lot of uh, yeah. express declarations yeah. that that's what's going to happen. Because, yeah, yeah the, I think minimize I think, expectations. Yeah, because yeah, to me, it's kind of the difference of um, like if you think about about reading a reading a book or a book series, right? Like the book uh, is broken up into chapters, right? And so uh, any one of those chapters is a complete chunk of the story that has like purposeful threads that it's setting up and things that it's re- that it's resolving and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then the book as a whole is also a sort of a purposeful containerization of that chunk of the story, mm-hmm. where it has its own arc and everything like that, right? Yeah, and once it's published, uh, it's just it's how it's it is just now. out there. Yeah. yeah. And so one of the, what I kind of the difference, the differences then is like in a, in an early access game, it's more like a draft. It's a, yeah. it's like a draft of a story. And so you don't necessarily want to read it. It actually is like, it's worse than, than not having the story to read a part of the story that is half thought out where like the, the author like starts a thread. Cause I think it might be interesting, but then in the final version of the book, it's just not there or they, you or know they, it. you know, yeah, about it though. Yeah. yeah. Or a character does something that doesn't actually make any sense for that character, but the author is just like trying to figure out how to make it, you know, make something interesting happen here. Right. Um, and then again, like something will start to happen and then just nothing happens. Right. Yeah, because it's all it's all partially done, right? And so it's not really until it's 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 uh, revised and finished and then delivered as like a total package that the story is actually a satisfying uh, experience. And it's uh, and without that, it's worse than it's worse to have a bad story that has a bunch of random garbage in it than to not have the story, <laughs> right? And there, and there are. Uh, uh, there are multiple business reasons to do early access, right? And so for the, if we're talking about in terms of level head, we had a business reason, which was to get a launch out before our what we saw as our main competitor came out, which was Mario Maker 2? Two, 2. two, two, two. two. Yeah. Um, and so we just needed to get the game in people's hands, but it wasn't in a state where we were confident being like, this is polished enough that we can just 
publish it, but actually more importantly, full on publishing with like all of the backing that you want from all of your business partners, getting all your business partnerships lined up and uh, getting all of your um, localization done. Like all this, all the orchestration has to happen to successfully publish a title is very time consuming and, and like requires a lot of months up front to make sure everything gets pulled off correctly. Right. And we didn't, we just didn't have the kind of time given all of a sudden we had this big time constraint. And the one thing we could do and could push for was an early access launch because that let us get the game out so that we kind of, you know, got to jump the gun on our competitor a bit. Um, but in a way that for most other kinds of business relationships, um, like Steam early access isn't considered to be like a full launch. It's considered to it's be minimal. It's minimal impact actually. Yeah. So it doesn't impact all of your business action. options as intensely as like a, yeah full on launch right and so so early access actually gives you this sort of bus- this interesting business angle where the game can be can be completely done and then you can go into early access to answer other questions or to manage some aspect of your overall business strategy um, because if you're really confident about your game but you can't get any business partners on board um early so access first point at the data yeah That's early great. access first and all of a sudden if the game does as well as you thought it would do then now all of a sudden getting all your other partners on board becomes a lot easier but you haven't necessarily prevented this from being possible by yeah. by not quote unquote sim shipping which is when you launch on all platforms at the same time or whatever or now you can't do an exclusivity arrangement or whatever because because weirdly still today steam early access is considered as like not a real launch by most of your potential Nobody seems to care, which is great it's it largely it's a prototype yeah, if you can yeah. if you can pull positive looking data out of it, then it's it tends to be a win kind of across yeah. the board. Uh, if you're looking for trying to get those business connections established and stuff. Yeah, yeah. so that, I so think that, which so I think given all the other stuff we talked about, I think like if we were to do early access with with uh, Crashlands two, it would probably largely be for business reasons, not for development mm-hmm. reasons, and the game would have yeah. to already be Just not necessarily that. like <laughs> done done, but it have to be really close to. It done. would have to be. Very meaningfully compartmentalized, and we yeah. would have to really work hard to change how we're developing it to make yeah. early. Like we would have to, we hard. would have to be in that part where we we're like, okay, we do know how the game works. All the core systems are in the place. Where we don't, we can even if we decide we want to change the opening, we can get away with we're not not meaningfully change it because at that yeah. point we've like you know completed a biome and now it's like okay we could launch this while we work on the next biome because we can I get modular content that's kind of kept separate enough. Yeah. Yep. So at the moment, uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, all right. Next and last question of this episode comes from Chalosis, who says, do you ever change the gameplay of an enemy or an item after being inspired by Sam's final artwork? Mm, yes. Don't those go pretty hand in hand as an iterative process anyway? Like, isn't yeah. that, isn't it not so much like. I mean, I don't really participate in these because I'm, you know, doing other stuff. But what it seems to me from the outside is that there's like initial ideation based on what you already think that it's supposed to do in game. Mm-hmm. But then just kind of tight collaborative and iterative feedback loop between like what it's doing and what it looks like until it ends up in some final state. So, yeah, it, it feeds back and forth just continuously. Yeah. yeah there's really. a lot, And there's also, I mean, there's just... When you're trying to go from that initial idea to, again, the, like on the ground implementation of something to, there's also a, a variety of sort of complicating factors that make it so that you suddenly change stuff. So, you know, for example, if if there's like a, what we think is going to be a really cool animation for something that I've worked up, uh, but it would actually require like some really weird, just some weird shit that we actually don't have the tech for or whatever else. And that whole sequence is supposed to be for a particular move for a creature. Um, and then it turns out like in order to do that, then Seth would also need to put in like 10 more hours to figure out how we can make that happen instead of just simplifying it or just doing something else entirely. Uh, there's a variety of those things that happen, but then also I think that's also the place where oftentimes the animations push on the tech side quite a bit. Like the, the Fanta, for example, still isn't fully implemented. Uh, this is like a giant sort of a, almost like a goldfish manta ray. It's thing a that, sting, yeah, it's a stingray jellyfish. It's yeah, it's very weird looking. Um, but basically it screams and and then leaps. It's supposed to leap across whatever distance is between you and it, almost like the Wampet from the original, um, and basically do sort of like a, a breach, like a whale breach body slam sort of thing on the ground. Well, we came up with that. We talked about it and it was like, yeah, let's do that. Sounds fun. Sounds cool. Um, 
knowing that we didn't have the, actually the tech to fling the creature in that particular way during its animation, right? Um, and we still don't, but it's one of those things that's like, we're, we'll need it for a variety of things. And so it's one of those where the, the animations can also push certain parts of the game's systems to be developed, almost like prioritize ahead of other ones, or whatever else, depending on kind of which weird creatures do and what weird thing. And even the, the first creature, which is the Slugabun, um, which people actually saw uh, concept art for back in one of the newsletters, um, that thing hops as its movement style, which turns out is like an exceptionally complicated way of moving uh, as far as like binding that in with animations and stuff. Um, well, it's, and it's because it's a, it's movement, movement in stutters, but with yes. verticality, right? So it's like, if you're just, if you're just scuttling on the ground then you can scuttle at a constant speed and just follow the, the pathfinding, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and you can, and you're just stuck to the ground. So it's also visually, it's like, there's no Z, there's no, there's no third axis to take into account. But when it comes to a hopping creature, yeah, it's got like, it has, it has to go airborne. So you have to figure out how high it's going to go, make sure that it doesn't go too high to go like through like rooftops or other, mm -hmm. other things. And then it doesn't move once it's on the ground because it's preparing for its next hop. Yeah, so you, you don't to, just slide. You don't like hit the ground. Like, loop. Yeah. And, it and <laughs> the hopping interacts with other things. So, for example, if the creature has an attack that it can do, mm -hmm. well, it can't really initiate that attack that attack mid air because the animation is something that it does once it's on the ground. So it's it's yep. uh, you know combat abilities need to talk to its movement system in a meaningful yeah. way you know so there's there's these occasional things where just the way that that a preacher shakes out to be really fun and interesting um end up pushing some of the other systems or deciding our implementation order for certain kinds of systems like you know how, how, how things move you generally want to start with the easy one which is like basically that crawling constant speed <laughs> i'm not worried about it. it's just fucking easy right follow the pathfinding and that at the speed that you go and that's that uh versus in the slugabun's case ended up being the case being the first enemy that that hopping was required as the first movement style, which was a lot more technically complex uh, and animation complex in terms of like interact, putting all the systems together. So there's been a few of those where it was like, it's not necessarily that I would do it differently because I think it's a great, I think that's a, a slug of bun I just love as like a first um, creature in the, in the world the player interacts with. But it is one of those things where the reality is that unless, unless it's a very clear directive ahead of time, as in like, hey, first creature needs to only, needs to like be bare bones from a mechanical perspective, given what we know, you know, if, if that's not necessarily part of the discussion early on, then it's easy to have, uh, have the animations and creatures or any other art that I do kind of accidentally in some ways force prioritization of things that might be hard to do earlier rather than later, which may not be a good idea, you know, it's not always a good idea. <laughs> well, yeah, well, this is also, it's a collaborative thing because you, you actually do, you know, as a development team, you get to choose how big of a problem something actually is going to be, right? So it's yeah. so like the Wampit uh, was a hopping creature and that, that was the first creature of yep. the original yep. game. Um, hooking up the Wampit was actually very easy because we just made it so that these these extra layers of things that we're talking about with the Slugabun – uh, we just didn't do those. So, <laughs> so the Womp, it actually doesn't pause uh, when it jumps. It just bounces. So there's no – and also uh, we didn't have spine. So it's animations. Uh, oh, put, putting those, put those, in, putting those in quotes. <laughs> uh, it's animations where literally us just kind of like flinging the thing into the air and having its leg kind of like trail behind a little bit, right? Yep. Um, so the animations were much simpler. Um, and on top of that, everything was hard-coded. So – if we have a creature that we want to behave a certain way, then then that creature is a unique object that I would just spend the day coding up its behaviors, and then that's it now. If we wanted another creature that behaved in a similar way, in many cases in the first game, that code was just copy-pasted over there yep. because also we couldn't make functions at that time, so code was not very reusable in Game Maker. It was like, just copy-paste the code over there, make a couple of tweaks to it, and you're done. So, you know, that has the, uh, the upside of, of you don't need Speed. to, you don't need to quote, like develop the tech to have a creature do a thing because you just code it exactly in that one spot. The downside then is, is only the programmer can make things happen, right? Yeah. Uh, which so the benefit is we, of having that slugabun hop done was then that later when we made some critters and there's one of which is the frog, which is a slug frog thing. Um, that I was able to just completely implement that hopping around, doing whatever I wanted to do, sound effects, everything, with and Seth didn't even know that it happened. I didn't even know that was going to be there. And then I boot up the game and then there's this little frog thing running around. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So 
So it's it's a uh, and when you think about this idea of like the 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 Fanta, this creature that you know does basically something like what the Wampet does, yes, which is it you know it does like a, a, a smash attack. There's there's several layers of concepts in there that none of the existing creatures have. One of them is that it's normally flying mm-hmm. and then it does a belly flop, which means it needs to be able to transition from some kind of a I'm not affected by gravity mode into I am now affected by gravity, but only during this moment, mm-hmm. right? And we have to be able to set that up in a way that um, that Sam or anybody else can just describe that in the game changer and that we don't have to do a custom code solution mm-hmm. to make that happen. Because then if we have another creature or a critter or something that we want to do something similar, then again, we would have to have a programmer take care of it again, right? So these things are kind of like a they're they they're taking longer to get to get initial the, fir- the first version of it, yeah. but then that is modular and reusable going forward in a non-programming way. And so um, it's it's uh, it kind of reminds me of the like of the idea of you know the compound interest thing, right? Which is like if you're earning you know a few percent interest on something, then it looks like it's barely moving at the beginning, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but in the long term. It just keeps building on itself and accelerates to just what looks like a vertical line, right? Um, whereas, which is what we're doing right now with our development. And we're starting to see that with some of these things where like the frog, we're like, all of a sudden there's this thing in the game and a programmer didn't even know about it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and in the past, it was more of a, of a X hours in, Y output out. So every hour of programming time would generate a certain amount of things in the game and then the scale of the game was just completely constrained constrained by that, by yeah. that right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, so things things are ramping up quite nicely uh, as far as that goes. But that also means that, as far as the question about um, changing the gameplay of something after being inspired by the mm-hmm. artwork of it and stuff like that, um, and something that, that has kind of changed is because Sam has the ability to fully design and implement something on his end with no other mm-hmm. uh, input, then in some cases we've actually accidentally short circuited that um, like collaborative ideation feedback loop, mm-hmm. unless we're being very purposeful about it. Because if, if something can go from zero to fully in the game with nobody else even knowing it, right. Um, then you do, unless you're being careful, you do miss out on the opportunities to, like get a uh, cool, like brainstorming while the thing is sort of hot, like while yeah. the thing is in development, you know? Um, and that is something that we've been trying to like be good about. You it's know, a thing that but, it largely doesn't happen for, I would say large, obvious things like creatures, you know, big, basically big things that are going to have large impact, but it's also one of those places where you, you actually want that, you know, you want the ability for in the same way you want the ability for a programmer to be able to run off and build up a bunch of stuff. Uh, with a design concept, but not much else in terms of agreed upon facts about the case. You you want your you know your designers, your art team to be able to run off and like to go prototype put stuff, stuff in the game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, provided it's not uh, yeah, not it's not undisciplined in the sense of like now that they did that thing that cost them a quarter of an hour, uh, it's going to require the programming team another. 17 hours to like actually get it to work and then everybody's got to integrate right. it. It's like dumb, right? We, we, that was one of the things we were definitely worried about making the game changer was this kind of oversight problem. I think it's largely been, been good. I think in the sense that I think like, it's been good. Yeah. We've been, it's, it's allowed for the smaller things that really, while you could get some, imp, like, you know, particular idiosyncrasies of like the way a trinket looks or like what it, you know, like just these little small things that like probably you could get away with almost like never having a conversation about 90% of them because it just isn't that big a deal, you know? Um, yeah. I well, think it helps, parts prevent, it helps prevent bike shedding, right? Where, yeah, because there's stuff yeah. like, so bike shedding, the idea of like, it's easy to focus on small stuff when yes. you need, when actually the big stuff is where people's time should be going, right? Because the reality of any, any project of any type or, or scale, right, is that it consists of some big concepts and components and then a jillion little concepts and components, yeah. right? And uh, all those like little tiny things, like they add up because there's a lot of them, right? And so you still need to be careful. You need good approaches. You need to be like improving this over time. And it still needs some level of collaboration. But you also can't spend the same amount of collaborative effort on no. – all of you that stuff. Want, yeah, you do not. And want you don't that want to all. because the because 
that stuff is always served better in a big picture way where it's like if we zoom out and think about these like what is the approach that we can take so that we require less you know simultaneous feedback cost. and collaboration stuff right um so that you can free up more time for the stuff that has a bigger effect because every, everything is just a bunch of you know duct tape strapped to duct tape mm -hmm. right <laughs> like keeping things mm -hmm. together and uh and stuff that like you know is not the way you wish that it was or or like if you've played anybody else's video game, which of course all of us have played lots of people's video games, there's lots of little tiny stuff and sometimes even really big stuff that you wish was different, right? But the person next to you wishes some other stuff was different. different you know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the same within – and I think about this like with uh, – like knowing which stuff like needs to be changed versus yes. like would be best – it would be better if we could change versus – uh, like, yeah, actually probably would be better, but it's fine. But it's fine. We yeah, can get away with there's, it. Right? There's a threshold thing. I think that's that's been one of the disciplines I think we've been developing as a team actually with us now that we have the Game Changer, which is which is actually having those thresholds. Yeah, trying, trying to find that like, point out. Yeah, which is like, hey, you know, I hear you saying that. I'm not sure that this actually matters in the like in the large kind of player impacting sense. And I think we can get away with not. And so basically you have to, over time, you do have to slowly start biasing toward that idea of getting away with stuff, right? And just, yeah. Just let it, letting things be, yeah, be what fine. they are. Well, and that's, yeah, you need, and you need to like basically uh, design and development pillars to decide. Exactly. What's the, problem. how to, how to, what to bias towards and how to, right? because things yeah. that, for example, that like impact developer cognitive load and time spend, like, that's usually going to be a high leverage place to then say, oh, yeah, this isn't working. This could be better yep. if like I Simplified. didn't have to do X, right? Well, okay, if we make that better, that's probably going to give us really good long-term gains, right? Mm -hmm. Versus like an individual game artifact, right? Like, oh, I wish this this like one little feature on this art asset, um, I wish was a different color or whatever, right? It's like, okay, you know, maybe – Maybe if we get around to it, you know, like <laughs> yeah, right, maybe right. that's true and we'll tweak it. But like if most of the players wouldn't notice, right? And if it doesn't actually impact the developer experience, then uh, – or if the players would have just a diversity of opinions on the topic, right? Yeah. Um, then, yeah, it's probably not worth the extra time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's uh, it's it's something to be aware of is is how like how feedback and collaboration kind of feeds into your process. But um, yeah, it's 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 going pretty well so far. Yeah. It's good. Uh, well, thank you very much for the questions, and that's all the time we have for today's episode. We'd like to thank our producers Fat Bard and Sampa Costa for putting the podcast together, and thanks to our community moderators who keep our Discord running. To get more involved in the Butterscotch community, go to podcast.bscotch.net, where we have links to the Discord, a way for you to donate, and links to the archives. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.